wearing Jensen's fleece jacket. To make certain, McAdam brings in a colleague from the Washington State Crime Lab, an expert in fiber comparison named George Johnston. And my specific part of this job was to examine, uh, to look for any kind of transfer of fibers. Fibers that may have been transferred from Arlene Jensen to the vehicle of Gary Ackley or vice versa. So that was my specific part of this analysis. Could Arlene have been in Ackley's vehicle? We found a large amount of debris, and, you know, grass and, and dirt and twigs and, and so forth, as well as the most common fiber, which is obviously the, the, the dark blue of her fleece. What we also started noticing is that we found a fairly large number of light brown, beige colored carpet fibers. Her carpeting in her house wasn't, wasn't beige or anything like that, so we thought, okay, perhaps she had been in a, in a vehicle that had this type of fibers. Johnston closely examines the tape lifts from Ackley's car, scanning for signs of the same purple fibers found on Arlene's jacket. We were able to find a, a number of these dark blue fibers, purplish type fibers, compare those microscopically, and they have the same microscopic characteristics, same chemical characteristics, the same appearance, the same color. The purple fibers lifted from Ackley's car and Arlene's jacket are a match. So are the beige carpet fibers removed from the same two sources. Fibers from Ackley's sheepskin seat covers appear obvious to Johnston. It's much thinner fiber, you know, just much different from a carpet fiber. And it was the same as the microscopic appearance of the, the seat of Ackley's car. So what we have indications are right there is, is a double transfer. A transfer not only from her jacket to his car, but also from his car to her jacket. The double transfer is now conclusive evidence, placing Arlene Jensen in the back seat of Ackley's car. And the purple fibers only came from one section of the seat. This indicates that Arlene was likely immobilized or unconscious before being put in the car. We have a two-way transfer at this point, and that is a remarkable piece of evidence. You don't have that very often. It is clear to us that there is a tie-in. And remember, she's never been in this car before. So we feel now that we're very, very close to moving forward. Prosecutors are now convinced they have enough evidence to bring Gary Ackley to trial. On August 15, 1997, Gary Ackley is arrested and charged with two counts of murder. Some 11 months after Gary Ackley allegedly committed back-to-back -back homicides, prosecutors and investigators prepare for trial. There's a lot of potentially incriminating evidence, but it's complicated, and explaining it to a jury won't be easy. The last thing you want to do is misstep. You don't want this individual to have any kind of an out in this, so you're working with your prosecutor's office to make sure that all of the pieces are in place here. But at a pre-trial hearing, defense lawyers threaten to block admission of the metal fragment evidence. They contend that everybody has metal fragments on their bodies. To prove their point, vacuum bags are taken from Arlene Jensen's home and turned over to the prosecution. Terry McAdam has the critical task of examining the evidence at the crime lab. So I looked at the vacuum cleaner in the lab, I looked at the vacuum cleaner I have per personally at home, I looked at several, about four or five different vacuum cleaners, and believe it or not, everybody does have metal fragments. It's a potentially devastating setback for the prosecution, but McAdam isn't done yet. He takes a closer look at the contents of the vacuum bags and compares them to the samples taken from the victim's bodies. He sees that metal fragments from a home are remnants of a person's daily routine. So they're from bits of cars, from road debris. That's what people have in their houses. They do not have stuff which you get from using a little cutting tool, lathe. They're not nice and shiny, on a, you know, not been exposed to the air. You don't get uh, grand polish and things in people's vacuums. The metal fragments from Arlene's home are dull, coarse, and rusted. Metal fragments from a machine shop, however, are shiny and polished. It's a question of old metal versus new metal. If you leave out 
metal, particularly iron, in the environment, and there's water available, air available, it rusts. So when you see fragments of metal, which are shiny, which have not been oxidized by the air, that means they have been recently produced, as opposed to old fragments, which are been oxidized and been right for a long time. So the fact that all these were shiny and of different shapes led me to think that they were recently produced due to several different types of uh, metalworking process. The prosecution presents the test results to the judge. She overrules the defense and admits the evidence into the record. Finally, the trial moves forward. Most of the time when evidence was being presented against Gary Ackley, he was rather emotionless. He sat at the council table taking notes with a very short pencil. He typically had a bored or annoyed expression on his face with his mouth open and his eyes rolling as if he was disgusted or bored with the whole process. He would shed a few crocodile tears when he thought it might help his cause. But the tears don't help. Neither do any of the defense team's other ploys. On September 14th, jurors return with a verdict. Guilty on both counts of first-degree murder. Before sentencing, family and friends of the victims are invited to speak. Among them, Stephanie's good friend, Lee Pereira. And I could have talked all about her, obviously, but who cares? Gary doesn't care. I just told him, hey, let's talk about you, Gary. You don't care about anyone but yourself, and your life's over, and you're going to prison, and you're going to go and suffer with much tougher, meaner people than you. And we'll see how you like it there. Gary Ackley is sentenced to life in prison. As for motive, no one knows for sure. Ackley maintains his innocence and isn't talking. Investigators later learn Arlene had threatened to take away his two kids. We don't understand to this moment why he would have felt it necessary to kill Arlene. Did he go to her home to confront her? Did he simply snap? Did he, in some state, was he under the influence of something and he felt emboldened to be able to, to do something? And even if Ackley had issues with his mother-in-law, why murder Stephanie Dietrich? Investigators have a theory that Ackley had confessed to Stephanie sometime after Arlene's body was discovered. He then killed her to keep her quiet. I think Gary Ackley revealed his true character when he confided in a long-lost friend, Stephanie Dietrich, about the position he found himself in, and then with nothing short of premeditated intent, knowing there was only one way he could get away with the murder of Arlene Jensen. It's hard not to have disdain for people like that. This was a right outcome to this. We are holding this man responsible for these deaths that he clearly caused.